Nearly two million years ago, on the edge of a high step overlooking what is now the Caucasus Mountains, a small group of archaic early humans gathered under a northern sky. These creatures were no longer mere animals chasing other animals. They were explorers blazing a path into new lands. And they may be the ancestors of all of us. But unlike other hominins, they were not following herds of African animals north. Every animal bone found at their campsite belongs to Eurasian species, which means these humans had stepped into a new ecological world and adapted to it independently. These hominins were the only African mammals in the Caucasus at that time, a sign they were behaving differently from other animals. They were short and stout creatures, strongly built with arms and torsos that still hinted at an arboreal past. Their brains were tiny by our standards, scarcely half the cranial volume of a modern human. Yet above them, in the darkness of an Ice Age night, the Aurora Borealis shimmered. For the first time in history, eyes belonging to our genus, Homo, watched that spectacle. These hominins, cousins of Homo habilis from Africa, had come farther north than any human before them. They were the pioneers of the Eurasian world. The site, carved into a volcanic promontory above a river, has become one of the most astonishing places in paleoanthropology. Here, five skulls preserve a frozen moment in time. They capture the transition from Homo habilis to Homo erectus, a moment when the first humans, small-brained and inexperienced, dared to leave the African cradle. Their bones were later gnawed by lions and hyenas. Their tools littered the ground beside shattered animal bones. But the fossils they left behind, delicate, imperfect but human, reveal the first outward pulse of our species' long migration across the planet. For decades, scientists assumed that the first humans to step beyond Africa were the tall, barrel-chested Homo erectus of Java, creatures already armed with the Aculean hand axe and a brain nearing a thousand cubic centimeters. The discovery in Eurasia upended that neat picture. These fossils, dating to about 1.8 million years ago, hint at beings far more primitive. No hand axes, no fire, no large brains, just crude older and flakes and the courage to wander. Their brain cases ranged from only 546 to 730 cubic centimetres, placing them squarely within or just above the range of Homo habilis, whose average was around 610 cubic centimetres. Yet their legs were long and their proportions nearly modern, traits that allowed them to cover the 6,000 kilometres 3,700 miles, from sub-Saharan Africa to the Caucasus Mountains. They had become walkers of the open steppe. Rick Potts of the Smithsonian called them the clearest window yet into the moment Homo erectus was born. That birth may have begun with Homo habilis, the handy man, in East Africa, 2.6 million years ago, when the first sharp-edged stones appeared in Ethiopia. Those flakes, the old one toolkit, were crude yet transformative. With them, early humans could slice meat from carcasses, crack bones for marrow and share food. A diet richer in fat and protein fed their brains and enabled long journeys through new environments. As climate oscillations turned forests into savannas, Homo habilis adapted not by digging in, but by moving on. From the East African Rift, the trail of stone tools leads north through Sudan and Egypt across a Sahara that was then green with lakes and grasslands. By 2.2 million years ago, there were tool sites in Algeria's Amboucheri Plateau. Within a few hundred thousand years, those wandering populations had reached the Caucasus, carrying nothing more complex than simple flakes and hammer stones. At this site, archaeologists found more than 15,000 flakes and cores in the volcanic sediments between 1.85 and 1.76 million years old. They were crafted from every material available, basalt, quartzite, rhyolite, even river pebbles. There was no aesthetic selection, only improvisation. They were using everything, said David Zvania of the Georgian National Museum. Those simple tools were their only technology. No evidence of fire appears at the site. Winters on the Caucasus steppe can be bitter, yet these humans endured without fire or fur clothing. Their skeletons suggest they were not huge. At roughly 1.5 metres tall, 
these hominins stood at about 4 feet 11 inches to 5 feet. Their body weight, estimated between 40 and 50 kilos, converts to approximately 90 to 110 pounds. In other words, they were about the size of a modern child, noticeably lighter and shorter than the later Homo erectus of Africa, such as Turkana boy, who stood close to 5 feet tall and would have reached about 6 feet 1.8 meters as an adult. This smaller stature of these hominins reflects both their primitive anatomy and their adaptation to the early stages of long-distance travel. Thin, lightly built, yet mobile enough to walk thousands of miles from Africa to the cold grasslands of the Caucasus. Some had been even maimed by predators. These were not the robust muscular giants once imagined as the first explorers. They were small hominins who had learned to endure through cooperation and scavenging. Ice Age Eurasia was not a gentle place. It teemed with Eurasian megafauna, Etruscan wolves, hyenas the size of lions, and saber-toothed cats. Fossil bones at the site bear their marks. Some of the hominin femurs show tooth punctures. Hyenas chewed their limbs after death. One geologist joked that someone rang the dinner bell. Humans and carnivores were eating each other. It was a world of mutual predation. Yet even in this dangerous ecosystem they thrived for a time. Their simple flakes were enough to butcher meat from carcasses and perhaps defend themselves. Piles of cobblestones found near a gully entrance may mark a defensive position where they hurled stones at predators. These guys were badasses. Competing directly with cave lions for meat, they were not weak and frail as has been suggested in the past. Even with primitive tools, they had become dangerous omnivores capable of living alongside the top predators of Eurasia. In Eurasia, the age of the fossil apes was ending, just as the age of humans was beginning. These hominins, with their simple tools and short frames, represented not just a new species, but a new ecological experiment, an ape that could live without trees, that could range across grasslands and cold steppes, and that would one day spread to every corner of the earth. They were walking in the footsteps of some of the last Eurasian fossil apes, who walked upright long before chimpanzees evolved. The story of these first Eurasians comes to life in five extraordinary skulls. Demonisi I, with a cranial capacity of 730 cubic centimetres, is the largest and most erectus-like. Its cranium is low and long, its face projecting slightly but not as much as the others, its brow ridge arches gently, foreshadowing the later Asian Homo erectus at Jokudian in China and Sangiran in Java. This is the individual that fits comfortably within the confines of Homo erectus. It might represent the offspring of the first population to grow larger brains on the journey north. Demonisi 2 and 3 are smaller, around 650 cubic centimetres, their faces broad and jawbones thick. They show strong links to Homo habilis and Australopithecus, especially in the curvature of the cheekbones and the size of the teeth. De Manisi IV is the most damaged, but reveals a youthful individual with worn incisors used as tools. And then there is De Manisi V, the most remarkable of them all. Its brain a mere 546 cubic centimetres, its face massive and chimp-like. When it was unveiled, scientists were astonished. It looked too primitive to be Homo erectus, yet too human to be anything else. The variation among these skulls is so great that some researchers argued they belonged to multiple species, perhaps a mix of Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and a local form dubbed Homo georgicus. But they were a single population, displaying natural variation within a species that was still evolving. When the five crania were compared to modern humans and chimps, their diversity fell within the normal range for a single species. What we were seeing, they argued, was evolution in motion, a species stretching between past and future. The three most primitive skulls, Damanisi III, IV, and V, stand as remarkable snapshots of humanity in transition. Their small brains, light bones, and primitive faces contrast sharply with the tall, broad-shouldered African Homo erectus, exemplified by the specimens from Kubifora, and the Turkana boy. Yet when all are viewed together, they reveal not separate kinds of human beings, but a single unfolding lineage, one that stretched from East Africa to the Caucasus and eventually to the far ends of Asia. 
the average cranial capacity of these early Eurasians is astonishingly small, between about 546 and 650 cubic centimetres. De Manisi V, with its squat vault and wide, heavy face, is particularly striking. Its brain is no larger than that of Homo habilis. Even so, the palate and skull structure are distinctly Homo erectus, rather than habilis. De Manisi III and IV fall in between. Their faces remain broad, their brows low and massive, yet the cranial vault begins to show the elongation characteristic of later erectus. This variation, once thought to represent several species, now appears to fall within the range of a single evolving population, a primitive form of Homo erectus descended from habilis-like ancestors that had only recently left Africa. By contrast, Kubifora from Kenya represents the fully developed African Homo erectus of about 1.6 million years ago. Its brain, at roughly 900 cubic centimetres, almost doubles that of the smallest Dominici skull. The face is flatter, the brow ridge more continuous and structured, and the cranial vault longer and smoother. The thick bones and expanded brain case show that by this stage Homo erectus had achieved a level of physical robustness, a neurological growth unknown to its Eurasian cousins. Turkana boy, found west of Lake Turkana and dating to a similar period, confirms the transformation below the neck. He was tall, likely close to six feet tall, with long legs, narrow hips, and a body built for endurance walking. His brain was just under 900 cubic centimetres, already larger than any Demanisi specimen could have reached. The contrast between these African fossils and their Eurasian relatives captures the rapid evolution that followed the first dispersal out of Africa. Homo habilis lacked the Aculean hand-axe tradition that defines Homo erectus in East Africa. Instead, they relied on the simpler Olduin toolkit, a technology of flakes and choppers. More than 15,000 such flakes have been found at Domanisi, cut from every available stone, basalt, quartzite, and even small river pebbles, showing no preference or standardization. They had no fire, no shelters, and no specialized hunting tools, yet they survived on a windswept steppe, teeming with giant hyenas, saber-toothed cats, and wolves. These early explorers used their flakes to scrape flesh from carcasses and break open bones for marrow, competing directly with predators. Their world was Eurasian, not African. All other animal fossils at the site belonged to local species, meaning that only the hominins themselves were outsiders, the lone African element in a foreign ecosystem. When their bones are examined closely, these hominins seem fragile next to Turkana boy's powerful frame. Their toe bones show that the forces of walking were distributed differently than in modern humans, suggesting a slightly rolling step, perhaps a vestige of a climbing ancestry. Yet even with such small stature, they endured through cooperation. The healing visible on injured bones implies that others helped the sick survive. Placed along a timeline, Demonisi formed the earliest phase of Homo erectus, a population of small-brained travellers who carried a habilis-grade mind into new landscapes. Kubifora and Turkana boy represent the later African culmination, bigger brains, taller bodies, and the birth of the Aculean hand-axe tradition. The differences between them mark not separate species but different moments in one evolutionary flow. De Manisi shows what erectus looked like at its beginning, exploratory, unrefined and astonishingly adaptable. Africa shows what that same lineage became after hundreds of thousands of years of growth, a confident walker of continents capable of enduring heat and cold and the first true cosmopolitan human. Seen together, these fossils define the bridge between Homo habilis and all later humanity. These hominins carried the habiline legacy out of Africa and across the Caucasus surviving on wits and raw meat beneath the green shimmer of northern skies. The hominins who remained behind evolved larger brains and stronger bodies, pushing the species toward the form we recognize as our ancestor. Between them lies the story of our beginning, a short, small-brained creature that nonetheless conquered distance, climate and fear, and in doing so became the first Homo erectus. As stated, these hominins walked upright, but their locomotion was not fully modern. Analyses of their toe bones reveal that the outer layer of cortical bone was not reinforced as in modern humans. 
They may have pushed off the outer edge of the foot when walking, as chimpanzees sometimes do, giving them a slightly rolling gait. Their hands were dexterous, but not as refined as later humans. Their arms still suggest some capacity for climbing. In every way, they were intermediate, a bridge between forest and plain. Their faces, though primitive, already showed the beginnings of our own structure, a flatter midface, smaller canines, and a less pronounced snout. The jaw of one individual shows healing around an abscess, proof that this early human lived for months after a painful infection, perhaps because others shared food with him. That glimmer of compassion suggests the first faint signs of the social bonding that would later define Homo sapiens. If these small-brained wanderers had crossed into Eurasia by 1.8 million years ago, they would have encountered long winters and clear polar nights. Geomagnetic records show that the auroral oval at that time extended southward during magnetic excursions. Standing beneath those skies, our ancestors may have seen the northern lights for the first time, green curtains rippling over the steppe. For creatures without language or myth, it must have been both terrifying and sublime, a natural theatre at the edge of their known world. The idea that Homo habilis and its descendants could reach this latitude challenges our assumptions about intelligence and adaptability. They had brains half our size and no fire, yet they survived glacial winds and predators. What they had instead was behavioural flexibility, the capacity to use any stone, any landscape, and any opportunity that nature offered. They could turn a river cobble into a cutting edge, a carcass into a meal, and an unfamiliar valley into a temporary home. This was the true spark of humanity long before the mastery of fire or the shaping of metal, an ability to adapt rather than specialise, to see possibility where other creatures saw only danger. It was this behavioural flexibility, more than brute strength or brain size, that allowed the small, badass hominins of Dominici, descendants of Homo habilis, to walk out of Africa and survive beneath the cold auroras of Eurasia. Please click on these links for more videos and thank you for watching.